ఇండో యుఎస్ సూపర్ స్పెషాలిటీ హాస్పిటల్ అమీర్పేట హైదరాబాద్ అత్యాధునిక సౌకర్యాలతో అపారమైన అనుభవం కలిగి సుశిక్షితులైన వైద్య బృందం చే జనరల్ చికిత్సలు శస్త్ర చికిత్సలు అందిస్తూ ఉన్నత శ్రేణి ప్రమాణాలు సౌకర్యాలు కలిగి సామాన్య మధ్య తరగతి వారికి కూడా అంకిత భావంతో వైద్య సేవలు అందిస్తుంది ఇండో యుఎస్ సూపర్ స్పెషాలిటీ హాస్పిటల్ లేటెస్ట్ టెక్నాలజీతో కూడిన ల్యాబ్లు ఆపరేషన్ థియేటర్లు కలిగి అన్ని వ్యాధులకు అన్ని వైద్య విభాగాలు కలిగి పేరు ప్రఖ్యాతులు కలిగిన హాస్పిటల్ ఇండో యుఎస్ సూపర్ స్పెషాలిటీ హాస్పిటల్ On behalf of Chairperson Usharani Manne and her committee, I, Priya Gastar, Honorary Secretary, welcome you to this afternoon's Knowledge Lab session, Check the Change. I used to be the proverbial ostrich, putting my head in the sand and pretending nothing was wrong. It was my best friend who persuaded me to get medical advice when I casually spoke about noticing a small lump in my breast. She just nagged and nagged and nagged. So I went just to shut her up. I didn't for a moment think it was going to be the big C. I was healthy, had breastfed my kids. I didn't smoke or drink. My mom had had breast cancer in the past, but we never talked about it. And I honestly didn't think it was going to happen to me. I am so glad my friend persuaded me to get help when she did. I am still here today for my family and while it did take some time and doing life is getting back to normal in hindsight i would have done everything differently and gone to the doctor sooner but i can tell you from this experience that you do, do need to speak up and get attention do not be the ostrich that i was this is a friend's take on her personal blog and i think it's advice that all of us need to take seriously very seriously whether it's a personal diagnosis or that of a loved one finding answers to your questions and a supportive community of people who understand the experience who can make all the difference from today's talk we hope to spark that realization and conversation not only for ourselves but for all those who love us I now invite Chairperson Usha Rani Manne to light the ceremonial lamp and deliver her welcome address. Dear Dr. Pregna Chigur Pati, past days, viewers and flow members, Namaste. I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy and healthy festive season. Even as we all pray to be delivered safely out of this year of the pandemic, there is one disease that has been a cause for concern for millions of our gender across the world. This disease knows no boundaries. knows no borders it's agnostic to race age and it certainly doesn't care for socio economic status it is estimated that one in every 28 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during her lifetime survival rate in india is about 60% a lot lesser than some other countries such as usa and this is not merely because of a lack of accessibility to medical infrastructure but because of a lack of awareness in the first place alarming as they are what do these numbers really mean it means one in 28 families will confront 
a crisis this year, one in 28 families will be subjected to the fear that they may lose a mother, a sister, a daughter, or a dear friend, and 60% of them will see that fear will become a reality. This Breast Cancer Awareness Month, let's encourage ourselves and the women in our lives, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, friends, and those who work for us to get a mammogram. Early detection saves lives. Let's work together to make stories of survivors, the story for every woman diagnosed with breast cancer. Over the next three days, please wear pink, make a photo or a video, post your thoughts on breast cancer awareness, post it on your social media handles and tag Flow Hyderabad, Fiki Flow and One Flow. Let's participate in this very important global conversation. Moving on, my dear friends, your chapter has taken long strides in the social outreach programs. 60 women farmers were trained in the manufacture of organic pesticides at Saidalpet village in Vikarabad district. My thanks to flow member Sujini Dundu for sponsoring the training and to Radha Rani and Sita Reddy for all the coordination and mobilization. 240 women successfully completed their training on how to start a new business conducted by Sleepwell Foundation. Thank you Radha Rani, our EC head and the EC member Prashanti Shekhar for mobilizing the candidates and made it possible. The IIIT Hyderabad boot camp was attended by 15 members of who six were shortlisted for the micro accelerator camp, the one-on-one -on -one mentoring under which is going on as we speak. The pitch day has been fixed for 10th November, wherein the six of them will be pitching their business proposals to a panel of VCs and angel investors. All the best to all the six. Thank you Nanda Maganti and Sarita Chilkapati for making it happen. Our tie up with McLean Group, facilitators of DDU GKY program of Government of India has taken shape. We were able to mobilize close to 50 youth of who 28 are women for their technical certificate programs that started today. Thanks to our RD Secretary Priya Gaster for this mobilization and coordination. You are already aware that on 30th of this month, we are presenting the second in our Game Changer series. True North with our dear past chairs, Monica Agarwal and Ray Kalahoti. It's going to be a very exciting session. So please do be there. India's water power is mighty, but unless harnessed and used properly, it can all go to waste. In our next power hour, Jalasya Rakshanam, we will have Sri Gajendra Singh Shekhawat of the Jal Shakti Ministry Abhiyan with us. Mark your calendar for the 9th of November. Our speaker today is a young breast cancer surgeon and consultant working with the renowned American Oncology Institute. Thank you, Dr. Pregna Chigurpati for joining us here this afternoon. I'm hopeful that your talk and exhortations will spur us into action and push us to take our annual health checkups more seriously. Before you start, over to Priya for introducing you to our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Usha. Dr. Pragna Chigurupati is an oncoplastic surgeon and breast oncology consultant, currently affiliated to American Oncology Institute at Hyderabad. She holds an MS in general surgery, MRCS from Edinburgh, Fellowship in HBNI Breast Oncology from Tata Memorial Hospital and UHNM Breast Oncoplastic Fellowship from RSUH UK. Her areas of expertise encompass benign and malignant breast diseases, conservative surgery, corrective and reconstructive procedures and diagnostic procedures. In her spare time, if any, 
She loves to indulge in her passion for planning themed events for family and friends, trying a hand at new recipes and painting. I invite you to take the stage, Dr. Pragya. Viewers, please leave your questions for our speaker in the chat boxes on Zoom, FB, and YouTube. We will be taking them up in the Q&A session after the talk. As requested earlier, please turn off your audio video feed through the duration of the talk. Over to you, doctor. Um, thank you, Ms. Priya. Thank you, Ms. Usha. I'm extremely happy to be here, especially because um, it's kind of interesting to be on the other end of the table. I've literally grown up with half of you. Um, I'm extremely delighted to be here today to, um, well, use this as a platform to spread awareness on a topic which is so close to my heart uh, for personal reasons as well. Um, as Ms. Usha has already mentioned, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and she's already given the statistics out, so I'm glad it's out there. Um, but besides just uh, talking about breast cancer as such, I'm also going to mention a few other issues of the breast today. Um, hope, hope this helps you and you can ask me any question with, at the end of the um, talk. So I'm just going to share my screen. Perfect. Can everyone see this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Hi everyone, I, like I was introduced, I'm Dr. Pagna Chigurupati Nara. I'm a consultant to breast oncologist and an oncoplastic surgeon. Um, I'm currently working at American Oncology Institute, Hyderabad. And to begin with, uh, before I get onto the breast cancer aspects of it, um, what you should also know is that every breast lump that a woman develops is not cancerous. Around eight to 10 lumps are actually benign, which means not cancerous. All the breast symptoms, which include breast pain, nipple discharge, nipple um, retraction, skin thickening, any skin changes, swelling elsewhere, change in the shape of the breast, they can be either malignant or benign. So if you have any symptom, do not just while it away saying it's benign, it could be cancerous. And if you ever develop a lump and you get a biopsy and they say it's a benign lump, be aware because most of the few of these benign lumps may turn cancerous over a period of time. Um, cancers or precancerous lumps or diseases do not always present as a lump. All the symptoms that I've just mentioned about may be just uh, the predecessors to precancerous or cancerous lumps. You do not always have to lose your breast if diagnosed with breast cancer. With the recent advances, there's so many things that you can do which would improve a person's quality of life. Breast cancer as such is curable if it's detected early. So do not panic and at the same time, do not ignore any of these symptoms, especially a woman about the age of 40. So just to mention a quick word on the incidence of breast cancer. Uh, according to the Globacon data in 2018, Breast cancer is one of the most common types of cancers and it's, it attributes to around 24.2% worldwide um, amongst the women, followed by colorectal cancers, which is 9.5. So there's a huge difference between breast and colorectal cancers right there. And when it comes to mortality from breast cancer, it's around 15%, which is again, quite high. Most of them are unfortunately attributed to the under, uh, underdeveloped or the developing countries compared to the developed countries. In 2018, which uh, amongst both the sex, between both the sex, men and women, were around 14% uh, when it came comes to breast cancer alone. Whereas in 2018, amongst all the females, 27.7% were attributed to breast cancer alone, which is a staggering high number. And this is the data according to 2018. Globocon. 2020, the most recent statistics in India show that there is an increasing number of patients between the age group of 25 and 40. And this is definitely a disturbing trend. If you look at this graph, the one, the, uh, the bars in the blue are 25 years ago and the bars in red are the current stats and the x-axis are the age groups. So if you look at 20 to 30 and 30 to 40, you can see a huge jump from 25 years ago to the current situation. And the same even between 40 and 50. So why does this jump occur? Why has this happened? I'll mention to you. I'll mention it to you in the next couple of slides. 
the incidence in india currently as um, Ms. mrs usha already mentioned is one in 28 but there is quite a divide even in this in india in urban women that's all of us it's one in 22 that is one in every 22 women have breast cancer and in the rural areas one in 64 women have breast cancer the reasons for this are obviously things like reproductive factors and lifestyle factors, which are the most important aspects. To put this in perspective, compared to the US, US, it's one in eight women. Looking at the numbers as such, you might think, okay, fine, we're at a better stage, but absolutely not. The total number of um, patients who present to us in the advanced cases or the metastatic cases, metastatic is basically when you present with the cancer, which is already spread to different parts of the body. Nearly 50% of them present to us with the advanced cases or the metastatic cases and 50 to 55 are early breast cancers, which makes a huge difference when you put things in perspective. The alarming changes. Back in the day, before 2008, cervical cancer was the most common cancer in India amongst the women. In 2008, breast cancer overtook in urban India, but not rural India. Whereas in 2012, there was a huge leap. Breast cancer now is the most common type of cancer in both urban as well as rural India. So if you look at the recent data, breast cancer as such is 25 to 32 percent, whereas cervical cancer is 8 to 9 percent. And this, this is again a huge gap. Why, does, why did this happen? One, the main reason is because HPV vaccine is available for cervical cancer. That does protect the young girl against cervical cancer. And unfortunately, there is no vaccine available for breast cancer at this moment in time. And the only uh, tool that will help prevent or detect early breast cancers is self-awareness and breast self-examination before, besides mammography. Again, like it was mentioned earlier, the survival rates are improving across the world. And in the US, it's approximately around 90 to 95% for early breast cancer. However, in India, it's only 60%. Why? 30 to 35% are locally advanced at the time of presentation. So the common symptoms that we can have in the breast, uh, the pictures might be slightly disturbing. I hope they don't really um, scare you away. So the most common symptoms are breast pain. Now, every one of us have experienced breast pain at some point or the, or the other through our lifetime. It could be cyclical, which is associated with the menstrual cycle, or non-cyclical, which is not associated with the menstrual cycle. It could be radiating from the shoulder, the chest bone, or the underlying muscles, especially when women work out, etc. The breast lumps, of course, the most common complaint in women are breast lumps. Nipple discharge, it could be mucky, which, is, which could mean infection, yellowish, green, bloody, clear, nipple inversion. So you have to keep, you have to understand how your nipples look like from a very young age. So you understand when it actually inverts and new symptoms or signs arise in the breast. Itching or crusting of the nipple. Now, most of the women who breastfeed, of course, do have symptoms of itching and cracking, crusting of the nipple, which generally should settle with moisturizers or um, low dose steroids. But some, sometimes this is not settled with some uh, simple conservative management. It might lead to something called eczema, or it might lead to other conditions, which, is, which are known as Paget's disease, which may or may not have an underlying cancer. I'll describe what Paget's disease is in a bit. The other symptoms are skin changes, such as infections, which, um, which basically look like in the pic this in the picture, the entire breast can become hot, warm, red, and it looks massive. And this could also be a sign of cancer. And the picture on the right is the most common fungal infection that occurs in the undersurface of the breast. And this is known as intertrigo, which um, the more it, it has a simple treatment to it, which is just basically keeping the area dry and hygiene. The other symptom is change in the size or the shape of the breast. So before you know what these symptoms and signs are in your body, the most important thing is, thing is knowing your breast, being aware of how your breast looks like from the time you start examining your breast. So breast cancer, what are the risk factors? They could be non-modifiable or they are modifiable. Now, obviously you, have, you can't really do anything about the non-modifiable factors such as age, gender, family history, length of the reproductive life, 
and others such as ethnicity, benign breast conditions, or previous chest irradiation. And those which are in our hands to modify are hormonal factors such as reproductive characteristics, exogenous hormones, or lifestyle factors. Risk factors. As a woman gets older, especially about the age of 40, the chances of her getting breast cancer during her lifetime jumps from 1 in 258 to 1 in 67. And obviously, females are more prone to breast cancer compared to men. Having said that, men do account for 1% of all the breast cancers. Family history. Now, when, people um, when patients come to me, I generally tend to ask them, why do you think you had breast cancer? And most of them end up saying, maybe someone in my family had it. But what you should know is that it's only 5 to 10% of all the breast cancers which are actually familial or they're hereditary. The rest of them are because of all the other factors that were mentioned before, which are known as sporadic. So what, I, what basically is family history is, if you know any member in your family with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and other kinds of cancers such as pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, some skin, skin cancer such as melanoma, make sure that you understand what age this person was diagnosed with the cancer, what exactly happened to them, what treatment they underwent, and what is their current situation. It's especially in your blood-related relatives rather than your mother-in-law or father-in-law. There's no connection over there. So if you think you have a family history of breast or ovarian cancer, there, there are professional genetic counselors you can reach out to who would make your family tree, like the picture on the right, and then suggest if you should go through a um, genetic test or not. The, the entire G, uh, gene panel as such is studied and they would tell you if you are at a higher risk of a particular cancer, so you can be uh, placed on surveillance from a much younger age. The other risk factors are hormonal risk factors, um, such as reproductive characteristics. Women, when they um, attain menarche or when they start their periods less uh, under the age of 12, or if they um, attain menopause above the age of 55, they are at a higher risk of breast cancer. Those women who did, um, who did not have children through their lifetime, of course, are at a higher um, risk of breast cancer. Late age of uh, first pregnancy, above the age of 35. These are generally the reproductive characteristics which lead to breast cancer. So why does this happen? Basically what happens is throughout your lifetime, you are increasing, there is a certain amount of estrogen exposure that your breasts have. So all these factors such as late, um, um, during your, I'll, I'll re-explain. So when you have your cycles, what happens is that there is a peak of estrogen before every cycle. When um, by attaining late menarche or early menopause, you're cutting short those estrogen exposure through, through your lifetime. Even while having children um, or when you're, when you're pregnant, you don't have your cycle. So again, that's cutting down the estrogen exposure. When you breastfeed, sometimes you don't get your cycles back after you give birth for quite a couple of months. So even then you're reducing the estrogen exposure to, um, to your body. Hence all those are meant to be protective factors. However, this is more of theory rather than practicality because I've seen many patients in my practice who had five kids or six kids and breastfed each one of them two to three for two to three years. This was, you know, women in the 60s or 70s at this point, they still do end up getting breast cancer. So although we don't have 100% evidence that these are absolutely going to protect, it, uh, protect you, um, you should be smart about reproductive age and your timeline. Uh, the other risk factors are um, exogenous hormones. Postmenopausal women, uh, more so in the West compared to, to uh, our country, they tend to get onto hormone replacement therapy, which uh, especially the combined ones, which have both estrogen and progesterone, which definitely put you on a higher risk of breast cancer because you're literally feeding your breast the estrogen that it should not get. And oral contraceptive pills, um, they, we do not have level one evidence for this, but they do have uh, a certain higher risk of getting breast cancer at some point, depending on how many years you take these oral contraceptive pills for. So if you are already at a higher risk of breast cancer, you'd rather think of other barrier methods of contraception. The most important um, factor today leading to breast cancer is lifestyle. Most of the women, especially in the postmenopausal um, age group, should be extremely careful because you, uh, even though the periods um, you know, stop and the ovaries stop functioning, the estrogen comes up from the peripheral fat 
As a woman's BMI increases, all that peripheral fat gets converted into estrogen and attacks your breast. And with um, recent urbanization and westernization of our diet, we have so much carbohydrate, high fatty diet, low fiber diet, sedentary, we've gotten used to a um, sedentary lifestyle, lesser fruit, vegetable, increase, uh, increase red meat, increase alcohol intake, especially during the lockdown and women of a higher socioeconomic status. Unfortunately, all these lead to a very, very different lifestyle and they are high, high risk factors, which again are modifiable. Um, okay, these are the non-modifiable risk factors again, the race and ethnicity. Um, obviously, the, we can't really do anything about them. Women who are white generally have uh, are at a higher risk of breast cancer compared to Caucasians, Asians, etc. And um, black women, although there's no increased, um, they, they don't have a high risk of getting breast cancer. If they do attain breast cancer, it's very, very aggressive in them. The other risk factor is benign breast conditions. Now, this is completely medical. There are certain lesions in the breast, which are known as hyperplasia, which put you at a higher risk of breast cancer at a later stage. So what I want you to take back from this point is, if God forbid you ever have to go for a mammogram and get detected with something, they do a small excision biopsy or they do a, perform a small surgery on you and then they say, okay, fine, it's not cancerous. What you should ask them, especially postmenopausal women are, what is this lesion? Does this lesion put me at a higher risk of breast cancer in the future? Because based on that, the surveillance generally changes. Um, previous chest radiation, generally younger girls and boys, um, for example, they have any cancers in, for, in thyroid, the neck, the lungs, etc. They might get radiation, which puts the breast under a higher risk of breast cancer in the later stages. So now that you know the risk factors, what are the screening techniques? Um, we have three main tools, breast self-examination, which is something that you have to do for yourselves every month. Clinical breast examination, which is basically what we would do on you when you come to visit us, any healthcare professional, and mammogram. Although the US Preventive Services Task Force recommendations say um, biennial mammography from the age of 50, that is every two years, let's talk about the Indian scenario. The, um, we have conducted many, many studies in big centers such as Tata Memorial Hospital and Adia Cancer Institute, etc., cetera, um, which um, they have shown that breast cancer predominantly occurs between the age groups of 40 and 49. But mammography in our country has shown to be effective based on studies only in the postmenopausal patients, which is about the age of 50. So obviously we cannot use this as a standard of screening in our country, not only because of the study aspects of it, also because we don't have resources to reach out to every woman in rural India or urban India. So, which is why breast self-examination and clinical breast examination are the best methods for early detection in our country. The main steps of breast self-examination. Now, this is something that every woman has to do every month. When, for a premenopausal woman, at the end of your menstrual cycle, wait for two to three days after the cycle ends and then examine your breast. For a postmenopausal woman, any one day of the month. Choose that day and make sure you repeat the same procedure on the, on the same day, the month after as well. So breast self-examination, there are two steps to this. One is looking and second is to feel. On the selected day, just get into your bathroom, undress yourself, look into a mirror with the arms by your side. Notice, look for any visible swellings, visible fullness, any skin changes. Is your nipple pulled inside? You can also place your arms on your hips and just push into your hips. Sometimes any skin changes become more evident on the breast. Raise your arms above the head. In this way, um, the undersurface of the breast is not missed and the outer aspect and the, the armpits are generally not missed, which are very, very important components of breast self-examination. And also, if there are any visible skin changes such as dimpling or puckering, raising your arms above the head make it more obvious because um, if, if there is a lump, the lump stays stationary inside the breast, whereas the skin, it moves on top of it. So that makes it even more visible. The second step is to feel. 
lie down on a bed place a pillow behind your head place your hand behind your neck and with using the soft pad of your opposite hand three fingers the middle three fingers just examine your breast either in concentric motions out to in or up to down and side to side although i prefer the circular motion it's totally up to you you have to examine your breast from the collarbone to the middle of the chest under surface of the breast the outer aspect of the breast and the armpit of course if you're going in concentric circles you will come to your nipple but do not forget to examine your nipple because it's extremely important um some women prefer doing this in the shower as it's easier to feel the skin is easier to feel at that point um this is a small video on breast self examination which might help you let's get started step 1 stand in front of the mirror and check your breasts for the changes including change in your breast size or shape thickening of the skin in the breast or underarm area swelling warmth redness or darkening of the breasts dimpling or puckering of the breast skin an itchy scaly sore or rash on the nipple pulling in of your nipple or another part of your breast or pain in one part of the breast step 2 now raise your hands and look under your breasts for the same changes also feel for lumps or hardness in this area step 3 next check your nipples for any discharge or fluid secretion nipple discharge may be watery milky yellowish or even tinged with blood and should be checked immediately step 4 lie down on a firm surface on your back and using slow circular motions feel your breasts for any kind of lump follow a pattern to be sure that you cover the whole breast you can begin at the nipple moving in larger and larger circles until you reach the outer edge of the breast check the inner part of your armpit as well always use opposite hands to check the breast step 5 stand up and repeat the same circular motions from step 4 across each breast step 6 if you detect anything suspicious in either of these steps don't panic make a note of your findings and schedule an appointment with your doctor immediately if everything seems okay you can be at ease but remember to conduct this examination every month but do keep in mind that you do it after your periods are over those who are not menstruating can do it on an assigned date every month remember cancer is not the end of the world in most cases women who are diagnosed with breast cancer survive and lead healthy lives especially when detected in time keep your date with your gynecologist or breast cancer specialist for an annual preventive breast exam early detection is the key be informed let's get stuck so i hope that was informative enough um so the signs to look out for swelling swelling of fullness of the breast breast lumps which look like this axillary lumps that is lumps in the armpit nipple inversion discharge or crusting skin thickening or redness change in the size or shape of the breast there are certain factors or certain signs that you have to look out for which are extremely important because these are nothing but advanced cases of cancer which might mimic other kinds of benign diseases the first one is something called puerperiage imagine an orange peel and imagine your skin becoming exactly like that 
that is a red flag. Inflammatory breast cancer. Now around 0.5 to 2% of all the cases present with something called inflammatory breast cancer, which mimics an infection. The entire breast becomes hard, warm, heavy, red, and it's rap it rapidly grows. So when you go with such a symptom to, your, to a doctor, sometimes they might be confused and start you on antibiotics. Remember, if the antibiotics are not reducing the signs or the symptoms, please make sure that you are evaluated properly with a mammogram and ultrasound or reach out to an oncologist or a breast specialist because they would clearly be able to make out the difference and it might necessitate a biopsy. This is another uh, picture of an inflammatory breast, a patient with inflammatory breast cancer. And earlier in the presentation, I talked about crusting of the nipple. Now, sometimes with um, minimal medication or steroids, if this condition of crusting of the nipple does not decrease, you have to be suspect of uh, something called Page's disease of the nipple, which may look like this. And the entire nipple generally is destroyed. We have to do a biopsy and take it forward. Also be aware that most breast cancers, especially in the early stages, are asymptomatic, so they might be found only on a mammogram. Although it is good news for the, uh, for the patient as it is early, you might miss it if you don't get a mammogram and it might just advance to LABC, which is locally advanced breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer. Um, and very rarely you do get symptoms of um, an ipsilateral arm swelling. That is, because breast cancer spreads to the armpit nodes as the first station, you might get a swelling there, which you might ignore, but that's, that particular node might impinge on the lymphatics, which carry the fluids in the arm, and it might block it, in, in turn causing an entire arm to be swollen up. That might be the initial presentation at times. And very rarely does the person present with something called metastatic symptoms, the, uh, the breast cancer, what you should know here is breast cancer spreads to the bone, lung, um, liver, and brain. So if it spreads to any of these um, organs, you might end up uh, with symptoms such as bone pains, fracture, neurological deficit, uh, breathlessness, cough, pain in the abdomen, lump in the abdomen, anorexia, or jaundice. And all these are nothing but symptoms in the advanced stages of breast cancer. So how do we diagnose this condition? If you have a clinically palpable lump, make sure that every one of you, whoever has a lump, or if you know anyone who has a lump, make sure that they undergo a triple assessment, which is clinical examination done by the doctor, a bilateral mammography, which is an imaging, especially for those above the age of 40. They generally tend to do an ultrasound for those under the age of 40. And a biopsy has to be done with it. Clinical breast examination is done by the doctor when they reach the clinic. Mammography is basically placement of the breast between two plates and from top to bottom and side to side. Um, and then you, people generally get scared to get a mammogram because of pain and radiation exposure. But the pain that you endure for one to two minutes might actually be a lot lesser than the benefits that you might get from a mammography. And radiation exposure, it's quite minimal and it is authorized by it's, in, it's in, in standards. When you do a mammogram, this is the, these are the images that you end up getting. And for example, if you can see this little lump here, this is what we detect. Make sure a biopsy, is, a biopsy is done based on what your doctor suggests to give you a final diagnosis. So pathology is basically uh, done. That is the diagnosis is basically given to you either by a fine needle aspiration cytology, which is a needle being uh, pricked into the lesion. And they take a little bit of an aspirate or fluid and send it for analysis. And a core biopsy is basically when you put a gun-like structure into the lesion and take multiple shots at it. Just to give you a brief about the different modalities of treatment in breast cancer as such. Local regional therapy is just the breast. It's surgery and radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is just current, current or light therapy that or x-rays that, that are directed at the breast to kill the cells, the cancerous cells. And systemic therapy, Remember, breast cancer is a systemic disease, so you have to attack even the system by, by using chemotherapy, hormone therapy, or something called targeted therapy, depending on what is driving the tumor. Also remember that breast cancer is not the job of just a breast surgeon or a medical oncologist, but it has multiple people involved, a breast surgeon, a radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, that's who gives you your chemotherapy and hormone therapy, a pathologist who gives you the diagnosis, 
radiologist in my view is the most important um, person and my personal best friend um also a physiotherapist a nutritionist and counselors are extremely important for complete management of the patient uh back in the day when breast surgery started it used to be quite massive the entire breast had to be removed with the underlying muscles as well and it used to be a massacre but currently with the advances we have not only come to preserve the breast but now we can do um oncoplastic work which is basically reconstruction focusing on the quality of life and if the person if the cancer actually spreads to the armpit nodes we don't have to completely clear the armpit for oncological clearance there are other procedures such as sentinel node biopsy or axillary sampling that have proven to be oncologically safe as well this is a quick note on breast conservation surgery the patient had a tumor here um it was removed obviously keeping in mind that there's no other lesion anywhere else in the breast now if you opt for a breast conservation surgery make sure that you will get radiation to the breast and sometimes to the bed of the tumor as well only then it is oncologically equivalent to removal of the whole breast now psychological effects of a woman um unfortunately when the woman is diagnosed with breast cancer she may undergo many many changes she might be scared she might be in shock she might be angry disbelief relief that she was diagnosed at an early stage anxiety depressed numb you don't know what the patient actually goes through some people actually might express in the in the clinic some people might need time to go back home digest the news and then come back to us so it's very important to give them time to digest the diagnosis and i in in my practice what i have seen is it all it was always helpful having someone else in the op in the clinic which could be their partner their family someone from the family or your friend and give the patient time to go back and they or take some time to go back understand everything and come back and for the women um obviously she needs time to digest the news and she should always have a one point contact which can be either the doctor herself the breast care nurse or any one expert in this field to answer questions at any point in time it completely depends on her if she wants to tell her family or friends and unfortunately she has a lot of stress anxiety mood swings depression they feel loss of there is a loss of identity and feeling isolated every woman reacts differently so you have to we have to individualize every woman and go accordingly the coping mechanisms for the patient to manage stress and anxiety you can distract them there's relaxation mindfulness and meditation one on one counseling with a therapist and something called cognitive behavioral therapy which is basically dealing with what is going on at the moment instead of bringing the past matters into the current situation how to deal with the current situation is called cognitive behavioral therapy and physical activities such as yoga has proved to be in, uh, helpful obviously she goes through depression so there are multiple uh, antidepressants that can be given to them um but what really is hard for the patient is life after treatment life after she undergoes the entire treatment array will the cancer come back whom do i talk to will will i have she might live in fear of the cancer coming back at any point of time it's very important for them to talk to someone and let it all out what can you or i do to help the patient obviously support is extremely important and more important is do not treat her as a patient do not and as for yourself do not be overburdened as a carer you have to take care of yourself as well give her her space uh, bring in family and friends to make sure that the environment is very positive you can encourage physical activity observe as a as a carer or as someone in the family member observe what she's going through record it and ask questions note them down ask the doctor or ask the one point contact understand the disease and moods and, and her mood swings obviously positive reaffirmation is extremely important but obviously none of this is easy diet and breast cancer um we we really can't say that these particular foods will prevent breast cancer as such but they have shown to be somewhat protective although we don't have level level 1 evidence preventive methods of breast cancer sometimes can be uh, having a good wholesome diet which includes five portions of fruit and vegetables a day um whole grains such as oats brown rice couscous or quinoa um certain amount of beans pulses fish 
Uh, meat, eggs, and other proteins should be a part of your diet. Fats should be less than 30%. And uh, you should try and include at least two portions of fish a week, especially the oily ones, which are, uh, for example, like salmon and mackerel. Um, dairy and alternatives. Of course, you can have them, but try to choose the ones with low sugar and low fat content. Limit alcohol to around 14 week, uh, units per week and try to do it on three non-consecutive days. Avoid salty food and sugary foods. Avoid saturated oils and spreads. Try to go towards avocado oil or olive oil. And phytoestrogens. Um, soy milk, tofu, etc., uh, linseed oil, all of them have estrogens the, the phytoestrogens, which basically mimic the estrogen in your body, but they are eat, consuming them is proven to be safe in limited quantities. And superfoods such as berries, raspberries, blueberries, um, green tea and broccoli have shown to be protective. And that's what the breast cancer patient generally is advised to have. But also remember that nobody has to stick to this diet because they obviously are going through a lot of um, other emotions in their system. So but these are all these might help having uh, a better outlook towards the um, lifestyle. The possible strategies for primary prevention is um, or risk reduction is quit smoking, start exercising, especially in the postmenopausal age group, limit alcohol intake, stop menopausal medications such as hormone replacement therapy. Breastfeeding has is proven to be protective. Um, early pregnancies, avoid long-term use of estrogens avoid adult weight gain, five servings of fruit or vegetables a day. Um, like I've mentioned, substitute your um, oils with olive oil, avocado oil, etc. And more than three hours of physical exercise every week. That could be just brisk walking has shown to be uh, protective. Again, limit alcohol. And the most important aspect is clinical breast examination from the age of 40 along with the mammogram done every year. You reach out to the doctor, get examined, and um, also get a mammogram done every year from the age of 40. And from the age of 25, make sure you are, um, you are aware of your breasts and you examine your breasts on a monthly basis. Of course, breast awareness means understanding what exactly your breasts look like so you can understand when something goes wrong. So towards the end, the common myths and misconceptions. The myth is finding a lump in your breast means you have breast cancer. That is not true. Like I've mentioned, around eight to 10, eight out of 10 breast lumps are absolutely benign. Unfortunately, in our country, so many women stay away from medical care. One, because they fear what they might find. Or two, they get so engrossed in their day-to-day -day activities of being a mother or being um, a carer of the house, so they neglect their own um, own health. I had patients coming to me in the past saying, I have a daughter's wedding, so can I get this treatment done in the past? I have my brother's wedding, which is why I didn't come to you earlier. And then there are other set of women who are in their early 30s or in, in the 30s, generally younger women who come to me with a lump, well, relatively in the advanced stages and say, I did not want to tell you anything because my husband wanted me to have a baby. That is absolutely absurd. So please take charge of your own health by monthly self-examinations and regular visits to the doctor and regularly scheduled mammograms. The other myth is men do not get breast cancer. Again, not true. Men do have, uh, get a condition known, uh, develop a condition known as gynecomastia, which is enlargement of both the breasts. And this generally happens because of hormonal imbalances, alcoholism, the liver gets affected and multiple other aspects in the breast. Um, and they also get breast cancer. Although it accounts to only 1%, when breast cancer occurs in men, it's extremely aggressive and tends to be detected late. Hence the prognosis is pretty bad. Having a family history of breast cancer means you will get breast cancer. It's, it's a myth. When you are diagnosed with a particular gene, which uh, it makes you more prone to getting uh, breast or ovarian cancer around 40 to 80%, but it does not mean you will absolutely get breast cancer. However, if you have a mother, daughter, sister, granddaughter who had had breast cancer, you should have a mammogram five years before the age of their diagnosis and make sure you reach out to a genetic counselor. The other common myth, which I was asked just day before yesterday is, breast cancer is a communicable disease. So this patient asked me, I have breast cancer, I'm going back home, I have grandchildren. Can, I, can they drink from the same glass? Can, they, can I touch them? 
obviously it's not contagious it's not a communicable disease breast cancer cannot be caught um, from someone else's body it occurs because it's a result, it's an uncontrolled cell growth in their own body because of multiple factors and lastly surgery for breast cancer means removal of the whole breast again not true uh, it multiple trials have shown that breast conservation surgery is equally safe and effective as mastectomy and today with oncoplasty the results are excellent and we can improve the person's quality of life as well so this concludes my talk if you have any queries please feel free to reach out to me thank you dr pragya you brought home um, so many plain truths ignorance is never bliss and this is a classic case i think where detection should begin with us there are quite a few questions waiting for you and for the first one we will go to chairperson osharani manne uh hi pragya thank you so much and uh, uh i think uh, actually i have written so many questions but you answered all the questions presentation <laughs> <laughs> Uh, i know you have already answered for this question also but again i'm asking because uh, once my gynecologist advised me to take a mammogram only once in 5 years after the age of 55 so is that the right approach no no absolutely not um current guidelines say that from the age of 40 onwards these are the nccn guidelines if anyone wants to refer um you have to get a clinical examination from the age of 40 which is what when you reach out to a doctor what we would do for you and a mammogram annually this is only if you're at an average risk which is when you don't have a family history of breast or ovarian cancer but if you have a higher risk of breast cancer it's a completely different picture a genetic counselor will act, will can give you what exactly you have to go through and at what uh, p intervals So, but if you are at an average risk from the age of forty every year until the age of seventy-five, and after that there are no recommendations. It depends on the person's will. Thank you so much. That's uh, I mean the entire presentation is really an eye-opener, and let me also congratulate you for that informative talk. And uh, <laughs> it was actually very positive in the approach, and it's always uh, encouraging to know that recovery is possible. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad we got the positive message at the end of the talk. Yes, yeah. Now I will give it to Priya to handle question and answers. Yeah. So there's a question from Prashanti and Ritu. They're asking if padded bras and underwire bras have any impact on us no. contracting breast cancer. No. Um, they unfortunately underwire bras sometimes might lead to infections, but not. infections only because it's constant friction at the under surface of the breast but not cancer. okay so that's new good news prashanti and uh, ritu you can go for it and vandana is asking does tightness in the breast indicate any signal and if there is a lump in your armpit could it be fat accumulated and how actually would you feel the pain in the armpit if you have cancer Okay, that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, detail answering to this. But okay, so to answer the first question, uh, swelling in the armpit can be either a node, which is relatively a lot deeper, and if if a woman is generally on the higher, like, a little chubbier, chubbier, then it's tough to examine yourself. So that's where a doctor we, you can reach out to a doctor to uh, assess the node. Having said that, if um, sometimes women might have uh, superficial swelling, which is nothing but fatty tissue, or sometimes accessory breast tissue. because sometimes during the development in during childhood there's a certain amount of breast tissue that might remain in the armpit that uh, starts begins to hurt during uh, mens your menstrual cycle and becomes larger so th that is nothing to worry about it just happens cyclically as long as it happens only during your cycle and uh, what was the other question priya just a minute yeah um if there is a lump in your armpit could it be fat accumulated and how actually would you feel the pain um it's it's basically some sort of pricking kind of pain or how you, if you can recall uh, during the it's during your premenstrual syndrome when your breasts become extremely heavy engorged and painful that's the kind of pain that you might um have even in that area if it's accessory breast tissue so um 
that it, it sometimes it can be pricking it can be pulling or it might feel warm the different kinds of pain and every woman honestly goes through different um, symptoms whereas uh, when it comes to a node again there is no specific kind of a pain unless it's extremely large then it feels heavy in your armpit but otherwise it's just generally the kind of pain you experience on a monthly basis thank you tejaswini yarlagadda is asking could you please elaborate on the safeguards one needs to take with early menarche kids as they are in the higher risk category they don't generally um, have to come under just because a person attained menarche at like maybe 9 or 10 it doesn't necessarily put them at a higher risk of breast cancer it increases the estrogen exposure through your life so all that i would suggest is that have a good lifestyle make sure you're not on the fat, uh, you know uh, have to have a good diet all these in fact lifestyle factors and reproductive factors and in fact more um, it, they help you uh, more towards preventing breast cancer rather than just that one factor of menarche because it's not in your hands okay i hope that answers your question yes and um, what about the side effects of the various treatments be it medicines radiation chemo maybe hormone therapy or even targeted therapy so each one of them have different side effects chemotherapy again uh, it depends on what kind of uh, medicine for example there's something called anthracyclines and something called taxanes which are completely medical so i'm not going to get into it but each drug have their own side effects which may range from generalized tiredness hair loss um, your immunity goes down so you're more prone to infections and um, if you come to the aspect of radiation they have other side effects such as ulceration your skin um, becomes dark because a lot of x rays going and attacking your skin generalized fatigability and when it comes to hormone therapy uh, it depends on what hormones you're taking for example tamoxifen is a very commonly used drug in breast cancer and precancerous lesions which um, the most common side effect of that is blood clots in your legs and uh, endometrial cancer Uh, obviously if you are starting on tamoxifen your doctor will be able to tell you how to take it and what side effects to look out for other hormonal medication can cause um weakening of knees uh joint pains etc so in targeted therapy again each one of these modalities have different side effects and um sometimes they may, might all be combined but the most common side effect in my practice is generalized fatigability and more prone to infections so because your immunity obviously decreases and loss of hair thank you and will the treatment and condition affect one's chances of having a baby and what if it is detected during pregnancy that's a very good question um so during pregnancy or one year after pregnancy is called pregnancy associated breast cancer now it's a very very challenging situation even for us to detect because one we can't do a mammogram during pregnancy unless it's absolutely required and so we have to take the necessary precautions like shielding the baby from the radiation so not only is the diagnosis hard but the treatment is also hard because we can't give all these different kinds of treatment throughout pregnancy we can only start chemotherapy in the second the third trimester we can only start radiation after the entire pregnancy is done a surgery can uh, we can we can perform surgery at any point so unfortunately uh, sometimes if, uh, if the if if, uh, if a young woman Uh, earlier on in her pregnancy develops a cancer we even might ask her to terminate her pregnancy because obviously her life is more important um so that's pregnancy associated breast cancer unfortunately it does have a relatively poor prognosis compared to any other woman thank you so much and there is one last question how is life after recovery generally how should it be every woman has a different they face different uh, realities every woman has a lot of symptoms and um feelings that they go through they have feelings of isolation sometimes they uh, they don't know what to do they don't know how to get back into uh, reality and continue their lifestyle so i in my in my practice i've seen uh, patients on two ends of the spectrum one is they're very very positive and they go ahead with life and if they have any symptoms they deal with it at that point of time they're very vigilant and they become volunteers they make sure everyone knows um what breast cancer is and sometimes they're very happy to you know uh, tell people that they had breast cancer they are survivors whereas on the other hand again 
women find it extremely tough to get out of it so it affects them mentally physically it affects their uh, relationships so i think at that point the family needs to come into the picture and they need to give all sorts of positive reaffirmation that's required okay <laughs> well that's a lot to understand and digest for one day but then it's it's been so informative and the ladies i think we all should hurry up and definitely schedule those annual health checks that we've been ignoring we can't we can't i think take the excuse of time or you know busy schedules and all that i think we just should go and should get it done and we know where to go to if we have any issue now Thank you, Dr. Pragya, for answering all those questions so patiently, despite that long talk that you did. And over now, <laughs> sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Over now to Umachi Gurupati, our senior vice chairperson for the vote of thanks. A very good afternoon. Uh, that's a very enlightening, informative, and useful session. Eat healthy. Stay active, avoid stress, be positive, enjoy what you are doing, and get regular health checkups. Those are a few take homes from this session. We all know that good health is true wealth. To keep the body in good health is our duty. There is this famous quote that says, "Women health." needs to be front and center it often is not but needs to be good health is sorry okay if you check the health of a woman you check the health of a society we all know that women are into multitasking they give priority to family their well being their happiness and many more aspects but often don't give priority to their own health and well being there is a lot of importance being given on breast cancer awareness in recent times why the main reason being we just saw, saw the statistics and growing numbers in the presentation today awareness about breast cancer is incredibly important as early detection can be most treatable this awareness is to reduce the stigma educate us on symptoms early diagnosis and the state of art of the treatment options available thank you so much pragya past 45 minutes is packed with such valuable information and we will definitely follow your advice and precautions given on behalf of the committee and members of flow hyderabad chapter once again thank you very much welcome mom <laughs> our gratitude to the gold sponsors polman group even partners indo us specialty hospital RBC worldwide our event partners pushpam publications our gifting partners i thank all our past chairs all the members of flow and other viewers who attended the program today i congratulate the team who worked very hard and brought in this awareness program and the technical team for all their support before i close i would like to mention that your health is an investment not an expense your attention is very much needed and your health is 100% your responsibility take care of it thank you so much thank you ma members for more such valuable sessions do subscribe and follow our social media pages on facebook insta youtube linkedin and twitter before you we see you all on 30th at our game changers session please take part in the think pink campaign that usha spoke about during her speech until then be aware be prepared and pick up the phone to schedule that long overdue health check today can we have the closing slides please
ఇండో యుఎస్ సూపర్ స్పెషాలిటీ హాస్పిటల్ అమీర్పేట హైదరాబాద్ అత్యాధునిక సౌకర్యాలతో అపారమైన అనుభవం కలిగి సుశిక్షితులైన వైద్య బృందం చే జనరల్ చికిత్సలు శస్త్ర చికిత్సలు అందిస్తూ ఉన్నత శ్రేణి ప్రమాణాలు సౌకర్యాలు కలిగి సామాన్య మధ్య తరగతి వారికి కూడా అంకిత భావంతో వైద్య సేవలు అందిస్తుంది ఇండో యుఎస్ సూపర్ స్పెషాలిటీ హాస్పిటల్ లేటెస్ట్ టెక్నాలజీతో కూడిన ల్యాబ్లు ఆపరేషన్ థియేటర్లు కలిగి అన్ని వ్యాధులకు అన్ని వైద్య విభాగాలు కలిగి పేరు ప్రఖ్యాతులు కలిగిన హాస్పిటల్ ఇండో యుఎస్ సూపర్ స్పెషాలిటీ హాస్పిటల్